Good morning, everybody. Um, so, the other day I was on the internet and I kept running across these articles that are claiming that there's this crisis going on with masculinity right now. A lot of people are worried that there's no real men in the world anymore. Uh, one of these articles said something like, there was once a time when men used to be real men, when they dressed with style and had a certain honor code that they followed. But unfortunately, those days are far gone, and what we're left with is, to be quite honest, I'm not sure. It's kind of a weird idea, right? So I want to take just a second, and uh, I want to ask you guys, what does a real man look like? Like, shout it out. <laughs> Something like that. I know it got ruined earlier, but it's all good. <laughs> um, and furthermore, what does a real man act like? What are his character traits? <laughs> or maybe... <laughs> Drake is all of our role models for masculinity, obviously. But um, if, you, if you kind of trace this on the internet, one of the most common ideas related to masculinity right now that I came across was the idea of being an alpha male, which struck me as kind of weird because you don't really hear that used scientifically with a lot of humans. So I decided to do some research and figure out where this idea came from. Um, after you know, a little time on the internet and reading a couple books, I found out that it all originated uh, with a scientist who studied wolves by the name of L. David Meck, um, who theorized that wolves have a male pack leader that achieved his status through dominating the rest of the pack and proving that he deserves the, stop, the top spot in the hierarchy. The only trouble with that is that he's denounced and recounted this theory ever since 1999 and released a statement saying that alpha implies competing with others to become a top dog by winning a contest or battle. However, most wolves who lead packs achieve their position by simply mating and producing pups, which then become their pack. Interesting to think that if you want to be an alpha male and apply this to human context, the new message really should be, if you want to be an alpha male, go be a great father and raise a family. Well, I know... Um, I know I've been talking more about wolves than anything else, so I'm going to go ahead and get on to the part where I talk about language. <laughs> this summer, I spent six weeks traveling abroad in the country of Argentina, mostly in the city of Buenos Aires. And while I was there, I learned a lot of lessons. I, um, I found living life in another language, in another culture, to be an experience that challenged me, it humbled me, and it made me question aspects of my identity and personality that I'd never been forced to confront before. I think the first big thing that I had to deal with was being an outsider in another culture. And this is a position that men are rarely put in in our daily social lives. Um, you have to pay attention to what is and isn't appropriate on a daily basis and figure out what you should and shouldn't do. As we're all indoctrinated into our own social and cultural norms, this is something that we don't usually have to question until we go and live in another culture. The one cool thing that being an outsider does, though, is that it makes the most daily mundane activities become way more exciting. Like for me, I know personally while I was in Buenos Aires, like I got really excited just having a small conversation while I ordered some empanadas for lunch. or um, or. Perhaps my favorite was being able to convince people que yo no soy de Alemania or that I wasn't German after Argentina lost in the World Cup. <laughs> um, living in a second language also forces you to confront failure, discomfort, and uncertainty as well. Uh, these are things that we talk about a lot, but you really don't have to confront them until you're in a position where you have no other choice. Personally, I found myself in a state that I could only describe as brain jello at the end of a lot of days, where I couldn't speak well in Spanish anymore and found myself not able to speak in English either. I guess, I guess my language center of my brain was just exhausted. And, um, and it got me thinking about failure in terms of languages, because I think a lot of people are afraid to say something wrong and get laughed at. And, What's really important about this is that you have to take those moments and be vulnerable to get better at anything, and doubly 
This is important for languages. It's okay not to be eloquent all the time. The real purpose of language is to communicate your ideas with other people. The real point of making a mistake is to apologize if you've offended anybody and learn from what that mistake was trying to teach you. So while I was in Argentina, I didn't fully realize how much my experiences were reshaping me. But as I got back to the US, I found myself reflecting a little bit more. The one question that everyone seemed to want to ask me was, are you fluent in Spanish now? And the funny thing was I only ever got asked that by people who only speak one language, which just interesting side note. But in my mind, I couldn't help but think, of course, I'm fluent in Spanish to you, but to anybody who actually speaks, I'm obviously not. The biggest takeaway from this experience was seeing how this could completely reshape the way that I even thought about human interactions. I realized that I was so happy just keeping up with other people's conversations that maybe I didn't need to contribute all the time. I used to suffer from this disease that affects a lot of men called always having some shit to say. I don't know if you've heard <laughs> about it before, but <laughs> I realized that just being present and listening to a conversation is just as valuable as having something con to contribute to it verbally. More concisely, I think that we, we listen to respond rather than to understand. And that, for me, that idea really clicked how important it is to really listen to what other people are actually saying. So, I want to take the last half of this speech to talk about flipping this idea of being a real man. Because as far as I'm concerned, you're a real man by identifying yourself as a man in the first place, no matter what you look like, no matter what you believe in. But I want to take this and flip what we should be aspiring to, to being a true man. A man who is true to yourself and true to others and true to your word. To understand this, you have to see some of the weird fallacies that we've been indoctrinated into in our culture. And I think often we take these so for granted that we don't really even realize how weird some of the things that we do on a daily basis are. One of the first things that I noticed was the idea that sex sells. We kind of hold this as a truism, especially in American culture. And while we've always believed in it, I'd personally like to consider myself someone who has a little more self-control and respect for others than to buy any product that you slap a model who's half naked onto. Personally, I don't care how big the model's breasts are. I'm not drinking Bud Light. It tastes horrible. <laughs> While sex is great and everything, we have to see past this and realize some of the other dangerous things that we're believing in. Another strange idea that men are especially indoctrinated into is the idea of individualism. The idea that maybe you're like this rugged, rough cowboy who lives on the land and needs no one else to survive. I know especially the company Marlboro has used this as a marketing technique to get more uh, male consumers. But what's interesting is this completely negates how interconnected we are as human beings. I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for thousands of people who have helped me along the way to achieve the life that I currently am allowed to live. Even on a daily basis, we don't think about the fact that someone made the food that we're eating or the fact that someone's driving this bus that we're riding on. We're in infinitely interconnected in more ways than we could ever imagine. Another interesting idea about masculinity that I'd like to confront is the idea that masculinity has to be performed all the time. Masculinity is inherently viewed as never good enough and when it's questioned, it is expected that a man will respond by proving his masculinity. This unfortunately often happens through acts of domination that include violence. And to me, this is unacceptable. Men only have to defend their manhood because, manhood because we're never taught to come to terms with it. We hear the phrase, man up and just do it all the time. But we never hear someone say, oh, woman down and be a little more empathetic, dude, chill out. <laughs> Although maybe we should start saying that. We could make it a thing. Um, this is also playing with the idea that men are afraid to seem in any way feminine. It's kind of an insult, like you play ball like a girl, you know? And that's, that's interesting because we're equating women with weakness and submissiveness. And furthermore, I find this to be another way to view the world that I can't accept. And my new favorite way to counter it is a quote by the lovely Betty White when she asks, why do people say grow some balls? Balls are weak and sensitive. If you want to be tough, grow a vagina, because those things can take a pounding. <laughs> I tried to be specific at the beginning of the speech 
that I was coming from the perspective of a white, cis, American, straight male. Because I think it's very important to be specific and clear about what perspective you are speaking your truth from. Gender inequality and sexism are unfortunately still very large global issues, and we still need to tackle them. But I think it's important to understand what truth you should and shouldn't speak your perspective from. I love interchanging ideas with other people, but if I had instead decided to give this talk about social issues that affect, for instance, like a queer black woman, I wouldn't be the right person to give that talk. As much as I love learning about other people's experiences, and as much as I would love to hear that talk, there's a time to speak and a time to listen. When you decide to speak, it's important to know if you are speaking your own truth. Because we have to know what stories and truths are and aren't ours to share. This brings us to our final question. How should we measure a man? Well, I'd like to preface this by saying the word man was actually a completely gender neutral term until the 20th century. The word men meant to think or have a cognitive mind, and the word man simply meant the thinker, and was a general term used synonymously with the word person. So if we examine this historically, being a man is more about being human than it is about your gender. But addressing masculinity in our present day society, I think being a man is about being powerful, but we've misconstrued power with domination. Domination is supremacy or preeminence over another, while power is simply the ability to act and produce an effect. Instead of measuring a man's power by his ability to control and dominate other people, I think that we should instead measure a man by his power and ability to create, care, and connect. I will leave you with two final questions to ask yourself throughout the day at any time. Are you openly speaking your personal intimate truth with the world? And more importantly, are you open to the truths that other people are sharing with you? Thank you.